Welcome to worship, all of you friends here in the sanctuary and joining us remotely. It is beautiful to see so many of you here today. Some of you uh, loyal family members here to see to hear Taya sing. Um, some of you newcomers. Uh, some of you visiting from the early service because you want to be here for Indigenous Peoples Sunday celebration. It is uh, wonderful to be able to join together to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Sunday and reflect today on our relationship to the many works of our Creator, all of whom are our kin. Our service today will include recorded music by Bill Miller, a well-known and much-loved musician of the Mohican Nation Stockbridge Muncie Band, that's a bit of a mouthful for me, who also happens to be the cousin of our very own Karen Miller. In the spirit of this day, I invite us to remember with gratitude the Ojibwe, Dakota, Menominee, and Ho-Chunk ancestors who belonged to this land long before European people arrived and who still offer love and care to this land today. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Kathleen Raymond and I'm the ordained minister here at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Menominee, Wisconsin. We are an open and affirming, just peace, dementia-friendly congregation, and we welcome you whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey and on your life's journey. I want to invite Karen Miller up. Um, are you ready? <laughs> to come up and share with us what she has brought to grace our table this morning. Um, Karen has done much of the work of planning and shaping this service, and she made the stole that I'm wearing. Some of you may remember um, that uh, we, we first, I first wore this um, at our service that three years ago, and so, um, and I get to jingle. And she arranged the medicines that are here on our table. I'll credit Kathy Colvin with the wonderful um, birch bark um, elements. And um, I believe it's Sally that put together this amazing bouquet. Karen. Bonjour. All right. Happy Indigenous Peoples Sunday. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, I have my um, notes with me because I, I realized that some of you have listened to um, Robin Wall Kimmerer and I didn't want to, you know, appear unprepared. She's uh, quite prepared. Um, I'm a novice, so I will give you what I know. And what I know is that the world is full of medicines. And medicines, there are four that are especially sacred um, to many um, indigenous tribes, people. Asema, which is tobacco. Bashkodejiwibak, which is sage, Wingashk, which is sweetgrass, and Gizik, which is cedar. Each of the sacred medicines is associated with a particular direction on the medicine wheel or the circle of life. Do you all know what the medicine wheel looks like or have seen something? This would be an example of the medicine wheel. They represent the four directions. They also represent certain places. There are certain animals associated with each direction. And there are certain medicines associated with each direction. So what we're going to talk about are just briefly are the, the, the medicines that are associated with the east, which is a, so a yellow color in the east. Um, Waban is, is the east. And Asema tobacco is the direction of knowledge in the place of the spirit. The teachings from the East remind us that all life is spirit and that to honor that life, we offer that tobacco and thanksgiving. It's often said that if there is no other medicine available, all you need is tobacco. And you only need a small amount. It's a very powerful medicine. It is the, it is the medicine that, that opens the door to communication with the great spirit and with other spirits and other medicines. So it can be used in conjunction with other medicines. Prayers of thanksgiving honor those, all those things that we cannot exist without, 
So for example, a sema is used in the mornings during the sunrise ceremony. Traditional people will go out and hold a sema in their left hand, which is closest to their heart, and they will welcome the new day. And once you do that, you can just put the asema down on the ground, or you can put it on the water, depending on what you're praying for or about. Um, you can also burn it. You can also smoke it. And if you ever have an opportunity to um, have a, be in a ceremony with a, with a pipe, um, do not inhale the smoke. Blow it out. It's not to be ingested. It's a prayer to the Creator. The medicine associated with the South is cedar, and that's represented by the red color. Um, Jawanang is the direction of growth and the place of hearts or emotions. And the cedar is the sacred medicine used to purify and protect all life on earth. It's oftentimes referred to as Nokomis Gizik, grandmother, grandmother cedar. Grandmothers will um, make little pillows for their grandchildren, um, little quilted pillows, and fill it with cedar um, for them to lie their head on at night to protect them from having bad dreams. Um, it's also used a lot in, in the, during the sweat lodge. The medicine associated with the West, Ingabiyan, is Bashkode Jiwibak, Jibak, Jibik, Sage. Is, I swear I cannot get that one right. Um, this is the direction of maturity and the place of the physical body. It's represented by the color black. Um, it is the sacred me medicine used to purify our hearts, our minds, and bodies and bring them into balance. By creating balance, we are able to properly evaluate, appreciate, and enjoy our lives. The medicine associated with the north, the white color, is wingush, sweetgrass. This is the direction of wisdom in the place of the mind or intellect. Wingust, as you know, is braided into three strands. And some, some say that the strands represent body, mind, and soul. Others say that the three, the three strands or three sections of the braids represent the seven generations that have come before us, the seven generations that will come be after us, and the seven teachings of the grandfathers. And the seven teachings of the grandfathers are those teachings that tell us how to live in community and survive. And those teachings are respect, love, truth, wisdom, generosity, humility, and bravery. How could I forget bravery? When I first learned about the medicine wheel, I thought that we, we traveled the medicine wheel, that we were in each direction for a period of time, and then we moved along to a new direction. And that's not how this works. The idea is that we are in the center of the medicine wheel. And we pass through each of these cycles many, many times throughout our lives. Some of these are cycles of, of stages of life, infancy, birth, in the East, young adulthood in the, in the South, adulthood in the West, and elder in the North. But we look to the natural world and each of those medicines in those directions to help us see ourselves and to learn the teachings that are associated with those directions. It is, our, it is up to us to choose to look we can travel that circle many times and not look, but it's up to us and our free will to look at those lessons and to learn from them. The whole world is a teacher. Everything can teach us something. And so that these particular medicines are especially sacred um, to almost all tribes, I think you will find. And you will hear other versions of the medicine wheel, and that's the variation is is common among tribes, it's a, it's, but, the, but the concepts are all the same, the directions, the medicines, and what they, um, what they do for us and how we use them. You are free to use these because they grow in the natural world. It's up to you to develop that relationship 
with that medicine. And you can develop a relationship with any medicine out in the natural world. It's not just for Indian people. Miigwech. She's switching hats. I'm switching hats. I'm now the deacon for the Mission for Peace and Justice <laughs> <laughs> Committee. Um, we will be holding our last silent vigil um, this coming Wednesday, um, uh, Wednesday, October 20th at 1 o'clock at the Cedar Rama Park. We will be um, again honoring the lives of uh, missing and murdered indigenous women um, this coming Wednesday. So if you are available and would like to join us, please do so. We'd love to have you. Thank you. And I also want to invite up Margie Staus uh, to, talk, to tell us just briefly about the um, ongoing collection for um, Afghan refugees. As we look around the church today, you'll notice that most of us have long shirts on. And there's a reason for it. It's obviously getting cold out. And so winter clothing is being collected for the Afghan refugees too. Um, it's going to be at the United Methodist Church and it'll be four Mondays from 2 to 6 p.m. It's starting tomorrow and will be the 25th, November 1st and the 8th. What they would like is new items and preferably in original packaging where appropriate. And we're looking for conservative and modest styles. So if anyone's interested in doing for this collection, the United Methodist Church, Mondays, 2 to 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. I want to remind us briefly that we are all remaining masked during the worship service, except those of us who are speaking or reading up front. And the reason that we do that is that our masking and our physical distancing are ways of loving our neighbors and our fellow worshipers during a time when COVID-19 continues to spread rapidly in our county and in our midst. Now I'd like us to transition. According to Robin Wall Kimmerer, who led a wonderful webinar last weekend for many of us in the Wisconsin Conference of the United Church of Christ, and I know a number of us here participated in that webinar, we are always to begin in gratitude. Because the earth and all who dwell here are gift, gifts from the Creator. So as we enter worship this morning, may we begin in deep gratitude and open ourselves to the presence of the spirit in which we live and move and have our being.
Please rise in body or in spirit and join with me in our call to worship. We gather to share in God's dream of abundant life for all. We gather to give and receive gifts of deep wisdom and love. We gather as a community to praise God, to seek transformation, to celebrate the power of the Spirit who is always moving. Let us worship God and let us join our voices in prayer. We give thanks to you, our creator, maker of heaven and earth. We come this day to listen and learn, sing and pray, to consider our place in the order of things you have created and are creating. We give thanks for the land on which we stand and acknowledge the wisdom we learn from indigenous peoples, that we are one with the earth its waters, air, animals, and plants. Many of us have come from other places, arriving from distant shores, our families arriving years ago or more recently. When settlers came, they were met by others who were already here, already knew these lands, already lived rich and full lives based on ancient and proud cultures. We name those people now, the Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Dakota. O oh God, as we acknowledge the peoples who have lived on and stewarded these lands since time immemorial and their continued claims to the land, help us to become neighbors that we might live together in better ways. For we are all kin in Christ. We are all related with each other and this good earth. Amen. And now remain standing as we join together in singing, Many and great, O God, are thy things, which is um, set to an ancient Dakota melody. And um, we will be led today by the choir who are in the front pews here. The rest of us will hum, they will sing with the words. <clears throat> my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, wrapped in light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent. You set the beams of your chambers on the waters. You make the clouds your chariot. 
You ride on the wings of the wind. You make the winds your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. You set the earth on its foundations so that it shall never be shaken. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they flee. At the sound of your thunder, they take flight. They rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys, to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And this is from Braiding Sweet Grass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. It is said that the Creator gathered together the four sacred elements and breathed life into them to give form to original man before setting him upon Turtle Island, the last of all beings to be created, first man, was given the name Nanabuju. The creator called out the name to the four directions so that the others would know who was coming. Nanabuju, part man, part Manito, a powerful spirit being, is the personification of life forces the Anishinaabe culture hero, and our great teacher of how to be human. In Nanabuju's form as original man, and in our own, we humans are the newest arrivals on Earth, the youngsters just learning to find our way. The creator gave Nanabuju some tasks in his role as original man. His original instructions his instructions were to walk in such a way that each step is a greeting to Mother Earth. But he wasn't quite sure yet what that meant. Fortunately, although his were the first man's prints upon the Earth, there were many paths to follow, made by all those whose home this already was. With all the power and all the failings of a human being, Nanabuju did his best with the original instructions and tried to become native to his new home. His legacy is that we are still trying. But the instructions have gotten tattered along the way and many have been forgotten. After all these generations since Columbus, some of the wisest of native elders still puzzle over the people who came to your, our shores. They look at the toll on the land and say, the problem with these new people is that they don't have both feet on the shore. One is still on the boat. They don't seem to know whether they're staying or not. This same observation is heard from some contemporary scholars who see in the social pathologies and relentlessly materialist culture, the fruit of homelessness, a rootless past. America has been called the home of second chances. For the sake of the peoples and the land, the urgent work of the second man may be to set aside the ways of the colonist and become indigenous to place. But can Americans as a nation of immigrants learn to live here as if we were staying with both feet on the shore?
Okay, thank you, Taya, for expressing that prayer for harmony and um, relationship, right relationship, which is so much of what today is about. Um, and thank you, Sandy, for um, that lovely rendition of um, both the psalm and our contemporary reading from Robin Wall Kimmerer. I've entitled this uh, sermon, Original Instructions. O Lord, how manifold are your works, writes the psalmist. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And from the teachings of the Anishinaabe, as told by Robin Wall Kimmerer, the creator gave Nanabojo some tasks in his role as original man, his original instructions. His instructions were to walk in such a way that each step is a greeting to Mother Earth. Back in the dark ages, when I was in my 20s, I worked for a women's organization whose core mission involved working across barriers that divide women from one another, especially barriers of race, nation, class, and sexual orientation. As I started reaching out across those barriers in my role for the organization, I began for the first time to engage with Native American women in the Twin Cities and across Minnesota to get to know them, interview them for articles, organize events and presentations, and try to identify issues of shared concern. I had no idea how little I knew. I had read Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and some books by Paula Gunn Allen, a native um, womanist writer at that time, and I thought that goodwill and our common gender were enough to connect us. I knew basically nothing about the local Native communities, the divisions and mistrust among them, the specific histories and traumas and struggles that defined them. I'm grateful to this day for the kindness and generosity and information a handful of Native women shared with a naive, idealistic young white woman who was forever stumbling and making missteps. And I'm grateful to the non-Native woman with deep experience in Indian country who taught me that the most important thing I needed to remember in any interactions with indigenous communities was the central matter of national sovereignty, and treaty rights. I began back then, very slowly, to grasp something that is only now starting to come more fully into focus. That something is the importance of land and the relationships each of our peoples have with the land in shaping European and Native American relationships across the divides of culture and history and colonization. I'm only beginning to grasp now, 30 some years later, as we celebrate our third year of Indigenous Peoples Sunday, Two years after participating in the blanket exercise, 
that it isn't possible for us to heal the ruptures between those of us descended from settlers and immigrants and those of us whose ancestors are indigenous to this place unless we work at the same time to heal our relationship with this land. Because in the cultures of the Ojibwe, Dakota, Menominee, and Ho-Chunk people whose ancestors reside in this place, there really is no meaningful distinction between the people and the land. Last Saturday, as she spoke to our virtual gathering, Robin Wall Kimmerer explored the deep differences in Western and indigenous understandings of land. In the Western cultural mindset that we all swim in daily, land is seen as property, as a place of natural resources. It is a thing to own. It is an object from which we take what we need. We are always at arm's length from the land. We don't experience ourselves as a part of the natural world, but as somehow separate. It's a refrain in Western thinking and philosophy to try to say, what is it that separates humans from the rest of the animals? We live on the land, but we are not in relationship with the land. In contrast, Kimmerer pointed out, traditional indigenous cultures mean something quite different when they talk about land. Kimmerer described it this way. We talk about land as a source of belonging, a source of identity. For many indigenous peoples, we are the land. The land does not belong to us, but we are of the land. And the land takes care of us. Land is our connection with our ancestors. It is also the place where we know we will one day become ancestors. Our lands are library, teacher, source of knowledge, healer. Land is inspirited, animate, deeply alive. Land is the place where we enact our moral responsibility for all of life. Land is sacred. What I hear as I reflect on those words is that when we repent of the sins of colonization and pray for healing between our peoples, as we have been doing in particular focused ways over the past three years, we must talk about our relationship with the land we inhabit and the earth that is our common home. That spiritual conversation that we must have isn't just about getting along better or treating our native kin more respectfully. The spiritual conversation must include our relationship with our creator and with the creation, with what the psalmist calls God's works. We need to consider the psalmist's call to praise and gratitude and reflect on a central question that Kimmerer asked in her presentation last week. How do we operate as if the world is a gift, not an object to be plundered to serve our desires, not a piece of property that we own, but a series of gifts that we are to respond to with gratitude and a commitment to give in return. Gratitude is core to biblical teaching as well as to indigenous understanding. This is not a new teaching. But somehow, through the unfolding of Western cultural, culture, science, and philosophy, we Western culture people began to see ourselves as dominant over the earth and entitled to take whatever we want without any thought for the consequences. In contrast, indigenous cultures see the water, the air, the trees, and growing plants, and all of the animals as persons and as relatives. 
In English, we refer to a tree or a lake as it, which Kimmerer notes is not the way we refer to a relative. If I were to see your grandmother bringing tea to us, I would never say, it is bringing us tea. That would be rude. I would say instead, your grandmother is serving us tea. I would acknowledge a relationship and an act of giving. But in English, the earth is it, the soil is it, the deer crossing the road is it, the hill I'm climbing up is it. As the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber noted a hundred years ago in his book, I and Thou, an I-it relationship is one of use. I use this thing that is an it. It exists only in relationship to my need. In contrast, an I-thou relationship is about dialogue and exchange and each party seeing and engaging with the other and being responsible to one another. We are not grateful to an it. We are not responsible to an it. When we live in a world surrounded by its, we become lonely and needy and greedy and entitled. And eventually, we start to see and treat other people as if they too are its, who exist only in relation to our needs. Once that happens, slavery and genocide become possible. Betrayed promises don't matter. Native children can be ripped from their families and buried in mass graves on the grounds of residential schools. Martin Buber taught that to be in relationship with God is a way of engaging in an I-thou relationship rather than an I-it relationship with the world. The universe becomes a person. Regardless of what Western culture may have done to put the world at arm's length, our deepest religious teachings can bring us back to relationship with the ones that St. Francis called Brother Sun and Sister Moon, Sister Water and Brother Fire. According to Anishinaabe mythology, the first man whose name was Nanabojo was directed by the creator, just as the biblical Adam was, to name the living beings around him. Nanabojo does that by spending time with these beings, learning about who they are, their history, their needs and preferences, and what they have to teach him about living in the world. He listens and observes, and the names come to him that way. He doesn't so much bestow names as discover them. This naming process acknowledges shared personhood and mutual responsibility. Our challenge on this Indigenous Peoples Sunday is to reach into the core of our spiritual identity and commitments to remember to root ourselves in gratitude and to acknowledge that we are kin. We talk now about God's kingdom. We are kin with all the creatures of this earth, the trees, the water, the air, the soil, the mountains, the valleys, the winged creatures, those with four legs and two legs, those who swim and those who crawl. These are all recipients of God's gifts of life and sustenance. They share their life essence with us, and we are called and bound to return the favor. We receive and we give, not just to other humans, but to the maple tree outside my front door, 
The sumac blooming along the roadsides, the living waters of the red cedar, the crows and squirrels and rabbits and deer that share our world so intimately here in Menominee and the Red Cedar watershed. Kimmerer told us what the native elders say about those of us descended from immigrants. <sighs> the problem with these new people is that they don't have both feet on the shore. One is still in the boat. They don't seem to know whether they're staying or not. When will we decide that we are here to stay? When will we recognize that God has placed us not at the pinnacle of existence, but as the newest strand in an intricate web? When will we take our humble place in that web of life, willing to learn, willing to quiet our greed and our cleverness, willing to let the earth and the beings we live among teach us how to live and thrive. A Dakota woman once said to me in those years in my 20s, she said, think about how different it might have been if the white man had sat and asked the uranium to yield its secrets to him before starting to mine it and use it. At the time, it sounded a little mystical to me, but I'm getting it now. I'm getting it. When will we acknowledge that the indigenous people who were here before us have been learning these lessons and have wisdom to pass on to us? When will we acknowledge that we do not own the land? As Kimmerer and the Bible teach us, we begin with gratitude and with the recognition that we are responsible to the source of these gifts. We are responsible to God, the creator and sustainer, and to the beings that offer their leaves and fruits and very lives so that we may eat, to the water that replenishes us, to the air that surrounds us, the sun that warms us and lights our days. We can offer small gestures of gratitude, like the man I heard about last week who pours a little of his morning coffee on the ground before drinking it as a way of saying thank you. We can learn the names and the stories of the trees and plants in our backyards and maybe our watershed. And of course, many of you are much more knowledgeable and familiar in that area than I am. You have things to teach me. We can say hello and goodbye to our geese relatives as they arrive in the spring and depart in the fall. We can begin with small steps to begin to live in a way that recognizes our kinship with all of God's creation. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. We are just one of those creatures. Let us be grateful. Amen.
Before we begin the prayers of the people, I want to share um, something that the council signed last week, a letter that we have sent off to the people of Ho-Chunk UCC, our kin in Black River Falls, a message of gratitude from our congregation to theirs. Dear friends, as we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Sunday on October 17th, 2021, we want to offer our sincere gratitude to you, our kin at Ho-Chunk United Church of Christ, for the work you have done to promote healing, reconciliation, and right relationship within the Wisconsin Conference and the National Conference of the United Church of Christ. We are grateful for your leadership in educating us about the wounds caused by the doctrine of discovery and the need to repudiate that history. We humbly acknowledge your invitation to all of us to work together to promote bonds of kinship and restore our shared relationship with Mother Earth. We especially want to thank you this year for your transforming leadership in promoting the name change from Pilgrim Center, which had all those connotations of colonization, to Dechola Center. Dechola means Green Lake in Ho-Chunk. This work took care, diligence, and respectful negotiation we know the deep spiritual importance of naming as it is taught in both the Christian tradition and indigenous traditions. We are grateful to be on a journey with you toward a reciprocal relationship between and among our peoples and the sacred land we share. In Christ and Wajuki Wanina, which means all our relatives, the council and pastor on behalf of the whole congregation, First Congregational United Church of Christ in Menominee. I also learned from a traditional Dakota woman many years ago that actions can be prayers and that gestures and uh, relationships can express prayer. So it seemed fitting to include that within our prayers of the people. And now I invite you to join your hearts with mine in the remainder of these prayers. Creator, spirit, comforter, advocate, we thank you for the blessings of the peoples of this land. We acknowledge with gratitude the welcome indigenous peoples gave to the first visitors who arrived here from afar. There were misunderstandings and hardship in those early relationships, but we also know that working relationships, bonds of friendship, and even bonds of kinship and love grew out of these early encounters. Through relationships and treaties, our European and indigenous ancestors in this place agreed to share these sacred lands in a covenantal relationship and to live side by side in peace as neighbors. But over and over again, the treaty agreements were violated and relationships were ruptured. We confess the violence, the theft of land, the ways that our European ancestors mistreated and objectified our native ancestors and kin. We grieve the ways that the Christian faith was used to justify gross abuse and mistreatment of indigenous people. And we grieve, Creator, the ways the land, which should have been our common bond, fell instead under the destruction of people who saw the land and inhabitants as existing only to serve their needs. We grieve the ways we continue to live out of harmony with your church and with one another. Thank you, gracious God, for our kin at Ho-Chunk UCC and in the Alliance for Justice who are showing us a way towards right relationship. Thank you for the renaming of the Pilgrim Center as it becomes the Dechola Center. 
Lord God, you know that we have a deep love for this place where our church building is located and our communal lives are rooted. Show us how to live deeply in the Red Cedar watershed, to learn the ways and names of the beings who are our kin. Grant us the gift of humility and the wisdom to learn from our native neighbors how to live with both feet on this land in relationships of respect and mutual giving. Creator and sustainer, receive our prayers of gratitude and care for those we know best here in our congregation. We give thanks for Frank as he enters his 86th year of life. May his next year lived in a new place close to Barb and their daughters be blessed with much that is good. We offer our gratitude for the completed adoption of Marie and Neil's great-granddaughters. We ask that you hold Lois in your care as she recovers from emergency surgery in Rochester. Sustain Susan as she continues to heal from her surgery, and we thank you for her presence among us today. Bless Pinckney as he continues to take this journey with her. Continue, O oh God, to hold close the family of Nancy Schofield as they grieve her passing. We hold before you Ren Wendy and Rob, Melissa's Aunt Judy and Nita's sister Lynn and their families as they walk the path of cancer and experience both suffering and healing. Bless Bill and Renee as Bill continues to recover from surgery and anticipates coming home soon after a month in the hospital. And we ask you to bless Joe and Margie as they continue their journey with Joe's illness. As we join our voices in the prayer that Jesus taught, accept our heart's prayer for all our relations. I address you today as Creator. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The offering time is always a time of gratitude. We reflect on all that we have been given. We consider what is ours to give in return. As we listen to our offertory, Bill Miller's Wind Spirit, please be thinking about how you can return the gift of time, the gifts of your life's energy, the gifts of your possessions for the good of God's kingdom and our right relationships here in this place at this time.
Please join your voices with mine in the prayer of dedication. For the wondrous gift of life, we are thankful, O oh God. Your generous outpouring of grace through the earth and her waters, air, animals, and plants reminds us of the fruitful life we are called to bear. May these gifts of time and labor embody our desire for your kingdom and contribute to your coming reign among us. Amen. And now please rise in body or in spirit. We will join the choir in They Will Sing, We Will Hum, God You Spin the Whirling Planets. Before I offer the benediction, I want to make sure you all know that there is not only coffee hour today, but there are muffins, um, courtesy of Karen Miller. Uh, they look wonderful, so um, please uh, join us in the Fellowship Hall and outside in the courtyard if you are able. Receive the benediction. May the God who creates this diverse and varied world surround you with beauty, guide you with wisdom, and hold you in kinship with all of creation. Amen. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.